We like to believe that computers are extremely capable, extremely precise, and above all, they don't make mistakes. Well, in general, computers do indeed, you know, not really make mistakes in the sense that as long as everything is coded properly, it will function the way you'd expect. But error correction is still something that is needed for the very simple reason that a lot of the time, what is not reliable isn't the computer itself, but a transmission channel. Whether you're sending information over the internet or say reading it off a disk, well, there are always chances of that data actually getting corrupted. And that is why we need error correction to either figure out where the errors are or to fix them entirely. So with that in mind, we're gonna take a look at several error correction techniques from extremely trivial ones to slightly more complex ones that are more powerful. You're watching another Random Wednesday episode on 0612 TV. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to another Random Wednesday episode. So today we're going to be looking at several strategies to either detect or correct errors. Now for the sake of simplicity, in this video we'll be talking about you know error correction in the context of transmitting bits over a wire, you know say on the internet. But as mentioned, this can apply to many different places, reading a CD, reading a QR code, really anything that involves you know some sort of a real world interfacing. But we'll stick to the internet analogy because, well, that works well enough. So with this preamble in mind, let us jump into taking a look at some of the more trivial techniques. First and foremost, the easiest way for you to guard yourself against, say, bit loss or corruption is to simply create redundancy. If I were to send every bit, say, three times over the wire, well, chances are some of it is going to come out correct. We can then take the average of all the redundancy and therefore have some confidence that, you know, the value we have actually resolved is correct. An advantage of doing things this way is, well, it is an extremely simple method. Of course, one huge disadvantage is that, well, for everything you want to send, you end up sending three times the amount of data, so it is not an efficient technique. <sighs> technique number two is called interleaving. Now, Interleaving actually makes some assumption about the nature of the errors that will be actually affecting the data. You see, we imagine that, you know, errors actually happen in short bursts. So if I have a string that looks something like this, a transmission error may cause, you know, a certain amount of information to get dropped out entirely. What then happens is we get a corrupted message and there is no way for us to actually figure out, you know, what the original message is. Since we assume that errors happen in this manner, what we can do is we can actually rearrange the message so that it is actually interleaved. In fact, what I've done is I've picked every third character and yeah, sort of just interleave them together to create this sort of code-like message. Now, imagine what happens if the same sort of error actually hits it. Sure, we still lose a chunk of information, but when we actually rearrange the data back into its correct order, we realize that the errors have actually been spread out throughout the message. What this gives us then is actually sufficient context to fill in the blanks. What this means is this technique doesn't actually fix anything. It is not an error correction technique. It is simply a technique of sending your information such that if there is an error, error correction can be done easier than if, you know, the data wasn't interleaved at all. This also assumes that you are actually able to reconstruct the data given the context, you know, given the bits that did actually arrive. In this case, since we're talking about English text, yes, we can do that. But if you're transferring something else, say an image or an audio file, maybe it might not be so easy. Technique number three is to use a digest. Now, let's say you want to send a packet of data. What you can do is you can perform some computation on that packet of data to generate what is known as a digest. Now, there are many different ways you can do this and we'll explore a couple of ways. But the idea is when the receiver actually gets the information at the end of the day, they will get both the data as well as the digest. What the receiving end then needs to do is it needs to actually compute the digest again based on the data it has received. If the digest that has been computed is the same as the digest that has been received, 
you get the assurance that whatever you have received is correct. The simplest way to do this is to use a parity bit. Here's the deal. Let's say you are transferring a small amount of bits. What you can do is you can actually calculate how many of the bits are ones. Then you can actually attach an additional bit that says that, you know, there are either an even or odd number of bits that are one. Of course, both sides need to sort of agree on a common ground on how they want to express this information. To do this, there are actually two different ways of expressing parity, even parity and odd parity. In even parity, your parity bit is one if the number of ones in the packet is even. For odd parity, the opposite is true. If there are an odd number of ones, then your parity bit will say one under odd parity. Whether you use even or odd parity doesn't really matter. In this particular case, it is just an issue of convention. Of course, both sides need to agree on this. Otherwise, nothing will make sense. Everything will break. Parity bits are very simple. And thanks to the fact that they operate at such a low level, you know, with bits, you can actually use them to check any kind of data that you're going to send over a line. Of course, at a higher level, there are more things you can do to check your data. For example, you can use a simple checking formula to generate either a check digit or a check sum. So we've actually talked about this before, so I won't go into too much detail. The idea is you want to do some calculations on your actual packet and generate a number that represents the packet in a similar way that, you know, your parity bit represents the packet. How this digit is eventually checked is exactly the same. The other end will do its own computation and check to see if what it has computed is the same as what it has received. If you want to step this up one notch further, you can also use a hashing algorithm. Hashing algorithms have the advantage of creating wildly different outputs, even if your input has only been changed a little bit. So it's extremely easy to identify issues in something you have received. Now that we've seen several techniques of detecting and correcting errors, let's now move on to take a look at a more robust, a more interesting technique in which not only can we detect that an error is present, we can even pinpoint exactly which bit has an error. This technique is basically a combination of, you know, technique two and three that we've seen earlier, and it's called the Hamming code. So here's the deal. Let's say we have a packet of information. What we want to do to actually generate our Hamming code is to sort of take note of what the positions of all the data bits are actually at. Do note that we are actually starting from one, not zero. And in this case, even though I'm showing you just 15 bits, this technique can actually be extended to any amount of bits. Also, instead of actually expressing these values as, well, numbers in decimal, we actually express them in binary. Don't be too worried about this. This expression is what actually helps us, you know, perform what a Hamming code needs to perform. All the positions that have just one one inside of, you know, the binary representation will be our check digits. And what's interesting about this technique is that each one of these check digits check a certain set of bits within the entire code itself. Take a look. The bit at the first position is represented with the binary code 0001. And what that means is, because the one is at the least significant bit, it will check all the other bits in which their position representations have a one in their least significant bit. So notice all these highlighted in red, all of their least significant bits are one. Do take note that we're actually talking about the positions here, so we still, at this point, know nothing about the actual value contained within the bit. Let's move on to look at our second check digit. In this case, because, well, the second least significant bit is 1, so we check all the bits in which the position, represented in binary, has 1 in the second least significant digit. So yeah, notice that we're actually looking at 2 bits, and then skipping 2, and then looking at 2 bits again. This pattern is going to continue, for our next check digit, we have the second most significant bit set to 1, and therefore we are checking all of those that have 1 in the same position. So now we are skipping 4, checking 4, skipping 4, checking 4, and so on. As you can imagine in this example for our very last check digit, it's going to check everything with 1 in the most significant bit. And what that means is it's essentially checking 
you know, the second half of our entire packet. Do note once again that this packet size is arbitrary. If you have a larger packet, this same pattern can still continue. What's very cool about this is that every single bit in the packet is checked by a unique combination of different checked bits. And in fact, we know for sure that everyone is checked by at least two or more. What this means is if there is an error in any bit at all, it will cause at least two checked bits to fail. And depending on which bit is actually broken, a unique set of checked digits are actually broken. And what that means is we can actually pinpoint which bit has a problem. Let's say for example that this bit has been corrupted. So we are not actually looking at the value here, but just imagine that, well, something has happened to this bit and the value is wrong. This actually causes these two check digits to fail. And thanks to the very creative way in which we've set this up, we can easily find out which bit has failed by simply taking a sum of the failing check bits. In this case, these are the two check bits that have failed we take their positions in binary, we sum them together, and this actually tells us that this is the bit that has failed. So the reason why a Hamming code is so powerful is because we have actually set it up to be so. Of course, the simplest way in which we actually do check bits is by simply using a parity bit. So in fact, each one of these check bits are simply parity bits. The actual bits they check are of course what we've mentioned earlier. And that was the Hamming code. Thanks to a very ingenious way of actually, you know, setting up all the check bits, we can actually find out where any error has actually occurred. And of course, since an error in terms of bits can only mean an inversion, well, we simply flip that bit and everything will be all right. Now, I should mention at this point that the variance of Hamming code we've just seen is only able to detect errors in one bit. What that means is if there are actually two errors in one packet, the best we can do is to actually, you know, compute all the parities and say that, hey, something is wrong somewhere. But we will no longer be able to pinpoint exactly which bit has an issue. In order to do that, we're going to have to actually stick even more parity checks on them. However, having said that, this is still a huge advantage over other techniques, say actually adding a parity bit. And the reason for this is, if a parity check fails, you have no way of actually fixing the error. All you can do is to actually request for a reset, and hopefully, you know, the new copy is actually correct. That is why there's actually a distinction between error detection and error correction. A parity bit is only able to detect errors. A Hamming code can actually correct them. And there you go, these are error detection and correction mechanisms. We've taken a look at several trivial ones, and then we've taken a look at the more complex Hamming code. The Hamming code tends to come up quite a lot in schools, so hopefully, you know, if you are a computer science student and when it does come along, well, you'll have enough of a background to handle it with relative ease. Anyway, that's all there is for this particular episode. Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you like this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may be interested in a playlist of my earlier work on computing and computer science topics. If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. You can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support.